The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. We are back for another episode of the Pest and Predator podcast brought to you by WGRF. Joining me today is Dr. John Givzlowski. He is an entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture. John, how are you? I'm doing great. How about you? Fantastic. So today on the Pest and Predator podcast, we're going to talk about three commonly misdiagnosed or misidentified beneficial insects. But but first, I, I think we should sort of talk about why it's important to uh, identify these beneficials uh, uh, properly, appropriately, so that uh, we know what we're working with. Yeah, one of the the challenges of uh, crop scouting is you really have to know not only the pest, but also the good guys. And there's a few of them where the good guys can easily be confused with the bad guys. And I've actually uh, witnessed people either wanting to or doing um, insecticide applications when they really didn't need to. And I'll just give you a couple examples. Um, I did I have an example of one time where somebody sent me a bunch of orange insects found on their sunflower heads, and they mailed them to me. But they got antsy in the meantime and sprayed the field. When I got them, they were a sample of a tiny bug called a minute pirate bug, which is a predator. They're good guys. They had uh, assumed they were red sunflower seed weevils. Easy mistake. A few times I've had people um, either send me samples or photos of these black, almost alligator-shaped insects that were all over their cereal crops, thinking, should we be in spraying these? And the short answer was no. Those are Lady beetle larvae, they're good. You want them. They're probably eating aphids, though. Check your aphid population, but if you're seeing lots of lady beetles, they're probably taking care of that for you. So it's good. Not only do you need to know your potential pests, get to know some of the beneficials, the common beneficials, because you don't want to misdiagnose them as being a, a potential problem. Yeah, and I can see how this happens because, you know, you got that sweep net, and you know, there's not like you're you're trying to sweep up beavers. Like there's, you know, we're talking about small, small sizes, right? And so sometimes you go by, oh, that's the color, right? And you're like, that must be this. And uh, I could see how that mistake could easily happen with a, a little bit closer I- inspection. We're going to talk about three commonly mistaken beneficials here today. Let's start off with the hoverfly larvae. W- what is what is that one? And what does it eat? And what are they trying to prey on? So hoverflies, as the name would imply, they're a fly with a dual beneficial role, but both the adults and the larva are often misdiagnosed. Now, the, the adult, the adults are really good bee and wasp mimics. And there's a lot of different types of these. There's 539 species of hoverflies in Canada. So it's a huge group. And again, good bee and wasp mimics. Um, some of them have... A lot of hair on their bodies, almost resemble a bumblebee. Others, it's more bare. There's various sizes to them, lots of different types. Um, now, as adults, all they do is feed on nectar and pollen. They're, um, they're decent pollinators, probably next to um, some of the different types of bees. They're probably one of the better pollinators out there as adults. Now, um, their juvenile stage is kind of is slug-like is the best way to describe it. They look like slugs. They're legless. They've got kind of a tapered front end to them with a hook on the end that they pierce their food with. They're usually either a light brownish color or they can be even a green color. Again, there's different species, so it really varies with the species. Now, they're legless. They can't move far. So... Uh, their, their favorite food is aphids. And aphids, when they feed, they give off this liquid called honeydew that they excrete when they feed. That honeydew has a smell to it. That smell draws the female hoverflies to where the aphids are. She lays her eggs 
usually right in or right next to that aphid colony. And these little slug-like larvae are getting in there and impaling the aphids and sucking the juice out of them. And over the past summer, we we had some aphid issues in our cereals. Um, there was a little bit of spraying. It wasn't a really bad year. But a few of the fields, there were very heavy levels of hoverfly larvae. And a few times I had agronomists phoning and saying, what are these things? Are these caterpillars? Should we be spraying them? <laughs> and, of course, short answer, no, do not be spraying the hoverfly larvae. Check your aphid population. <laughs> but if they're already being consumed, you know, the problem is probably disappearing. Uh, caterpillars will have legs. Not only will they have three sets at the front, they'll have usually anywhere from two to five sets at the back. Um, they're usually much larger than uh, the hoverfly larva. Uh, they're d- distinctive enough. So if it's more slug-like, legless, especially if it seems to be present where there's aphids, they're hoverfly larva. Enjoy the free service they're doing. Okay, so you, you've talked about how to identify them. How do we distinguish them from potential pest insects and don't make this this misidentification? Yeah, again, the main thing is, uh, if you're going to misidentify them as anything, you're probably going to think caterpillar. Okay. Um, armyworm was, was the one that um, over the past season people were worried about. Uh, because the previous season, we had some real armyworm issues in cereals. So people were worried that maybe these are armyworms up on the wheat. But again, um, armyworms, it, it, if you actually have a close look at one of the insects, you'll notice armyworms, you can see the legs. That's the easiest way. Look for legs. If there's no legs, it's uh, it's not a caterpillar. It's not an armyworm or any other caterpillar. Uh, it's quite possibly a fly larva. And if it seems to be somewhat slug-like, now there, you can get slugs in cereals. They're usually not a pest in the Canadian prairies. There's just rare exceptions where that can happen. Sometimes you can get slugs, but slugs are easy enough to tell from the um, hoverflies as well. The hoverflies, again, the front end is very, very tapered, and you, they're usually associated with aphids. Great stuff. Okay, let's talk about number two. We got the juvenile minute pirate bug. I love this. This is a great name for an insect. So talk about that one. Yeah. So first, pirate bug. Um, the adult stage is black and white. And when you look on their back, there's almost like a white X. Think of your skull and crossbones on a pirate's flag. Um, Good way to remember them. Now, the minute part, they're tiny. So minute pirate bugs, they're just a few millimeters long, even as adults. So they're tiny little things. Uh, If you were going to confuse the adult with anything, you'd probably be thinking maybe a plant bug such as a ligus bug, but they are much smaller than a ligus bug adult would be, so they shouldn't be confused. Uh, Where I've seen people misidentify them before is the juvenile stage is often a a yellow to an orange color. As they get bigger, sometimes they're almost... uh, um, a bright orange color as juveniles. And sometimes that can confuse people uh, because often when we learn about insects, we often learn about the adult stages. We don't spend enough time learning about some of the juvenile stages of some of these insects. And with the minute pirate bug, again, the juveniles are more of an orange thing. Uh, I gave the example earlier about um, the sunflowers and somebody thinking they were sun, red sunflower seed weevils. Weevils have a big snout at the front of their um, head, and they're going to be a lot larger than these tiny, minute pirate bugs would be. So, again, have a close look if, you, uh, if you're not sure, and uh, make sure you're making the right identification. Yeah, I, I, I like that name. That's a good one. Uh, number three is the stiletto fly larvae. And, and this is one where uh, I, I read that it can be confused with wireworms. Now, wireworms are hard enough to find on their own, but never mind misdiagnosing. So talk, talk about the stiletto fly larvae. Yeah, so once again, we, we um, don't spend enough time learning about some of the larval stages of these insects. And they almost look like a worm. They're um, fairly long, thin, white legless 
so very much worm-like. Now, one behavioral characteristic that you can use to help identify them, if you were to disturb them or poke at them, they start thrashing around. They will wiggle around really rapidly when you disturb them. So you can use that as a behavioral cue to help you figure out that um, this is not a wire worm. Now, wire worms, they can be this, of, of similar size as the stiletto fly larva. They usually have more color. So instead of being uh, a pale white, they're usually a yellowish tinge, sometimes almost an orangey color, depending on the species. There's different species of wireworms. They're different sizes and, and colors, but they're not pale like a stiletto fly larva would be. So if it looks too pale to be a wireworm, the other thing I would suggest you do, if you're not sure, is again, have a close look. Now, wireworms do have true legs. They've got, they're, wireworms are beetles. They've got um, a set of true legs at the front. They're small in wireworms, but if you um, have a close look, you will see the legs at the front of a wireworm, whereas stiletto flies, absolutely no legs. Very cool. Okay, so one of the keys here with beneficials is preserving them. Okay. And, uh, you know, beneficial insects are working for you for free <laughs> inside that, you know, in the canopy or in the soil. So with all three of these that are typically, you know, can be mis misidentified, how do we conserve them? One of the, the uh, things that um, we need to remember when we're talking about, um, uh, I guess, using our allies to our benefit is that often a sterile environment in the field isn't a good thing because if you wipe out all the insects that are there, there are some, um, I guess, early colonizers or in insect pests that are good at recolonizing a field that is basically a sterile environment. So if you can keep the beneficials around in the first place, that's going to help prevent uh, insect outbreaks from flaring up. So ways to do that. Um, Spraying only when needed is one of them. Uh, don't be tank mixing an insecticide in just in case there is potential pest insects there. Uh, have a look and know what you're dealing with. Um, again, there, there's there's potential harm and risk to creating a sterile environment when you really didn't need to. So only spray when needed. Now, for some insects, there's insecticides that will only kill a certain group of insects, An example being aphids. There's several insecticides that if you were to apply them, you'll kill aphids and maybe a few other sap feeding insects, but you won't be killing your lady beetles, your pollinators, your hoverfly larva, all the other things. So where more selective options like that are available and practical to use, uh, that's another good uh, option. And also, for some insects, you may not need to be spraying a whole field. You may be able to get away with either an edge spray or patch spray or spraying in strips. So there's some insects that you will see a definite edge effect. Uh, often early in the season, grasshoppers, as they're moving into crops, will have a very distinctive edge effect or um, ditch area in the, the field edge. So sometimes you can get away with doing an edge treatment um, cutworms, sometimes you have what we call cutworm patches, where it might be just uh, a, a small number of acres that really are heavily infested, and the rest of the field isn't too bad. And that can happen for several reasons. Um, when the adults are laying their eggs in the fall, if there's maybe a late flowering uh, patch of either weeds or crops, sometimes you get these these very patchy distributions if you can figure that out, you can just spray the patch and uh, save some money and save some beneficials. And the other one that, that some people have been doing is what we call strip spraying for insects like grasshoppers that are very mobile. Mm. Um, and this has been researched on pasture lands where they basically sprayed um, their controls. Where they sprayed the whole pasture, but for their treatment, they just sprayed in strips. So basically, they did about in their, in their experiment. They did a hundred feet sprayed, a hundred knots sprayed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they got about eighty to ninety percent control just by spraying in strips. 
which left refuges for the uh, the beneficials uh, because the grasshoppers were moving around. Now they got about ninety five percent control in their um, when they sprayed the whole pastures, um, but economically the strip spraying was the better option. Plus it left refuge for some beneficials. So there's for some insects there's going to be options like that that might be applicable to just to help. Um, use less insecticide and preserve their beneficial insects. Great stuff, John. Hey, John, really appreciate you joining us here today on the Pest and Predator podcast. Okay, thanks very much, Sean. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pest and Predator podcast. It's brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm.